All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here in person today uh, for this event. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a knowledge management specialist here in the Bureau for Food Security. I um, have been tasked with getting this uh, great seminar set up as a webinar. And so I just wanted to let you all know uh, that we have at least 40 people joining online, uh, USAID staff and implementing partners from around the world. And so uh, that's what the microphones are for. It doesn't feed into the room, per se, but this is so that um, all of our online colleagues can join us. And so when we get to the Q&A portion, I ask that you please just use the microphone that we pass around so that they can hear your questions. Um, that's pretty much the basics. Uh, to those of you online, thank you so much for joining. We are recording this session, so if you'd like to uh, review it at a later date or pass it on to your colleagues, uh, you can do so. And uh, if you're joining online, also please let us know um, who you are in the chat box, and um, we'll be engaging with you there. So I'll go ahead and pass this on to Julie Howard, who will be getting us kicked off. Thanks, Julie. And thanks to Julie and team for getting this special webinar set up in this room. So we don't usually have webinars out of this conference room. It's usually downstairs. So it's been a lot of extra effort on, on their part. So thanks to that team. My name's Julie Howard. I'm the chief scientist in the Bureau of Food Security. And it's, uh, it's great to welcome you all here, um, both you here in the room and you here online, uh, to a special seminar on scaling up agricultural technologies and results. So I just want to give you a couple minutes of background before introducing our, our speakers for today. Uh, many of you know, a little over a year ago, Administrator Shaw gave a speech to the CGIR directors and board chairs at the International Food Policy Research Institute here in Washington. During the speech, he focused on the low rate of agricultural technology adoption in Sub-Saharan Africa and many other countries where he works. Uh, very low rates of, of adoption of improved seeds and fertilizer. Um, and he challenged us, he challenged the CG system, he challenged all our implementing partners to look at how we can change the way we're doing business so that we can pretty dramatically scale up the impacts of available agricultural technologies and innovations so that we can improve the lives of farmers and communities where we're working. So over the past year, uh, we have been working very, very hard with our missions to actually think through and work through um, how would we go about changing the way we do business in this fundamental way uh, to have pretty dramatically scaled impacts. And fortunately, we, we haven't been alone in this quest. Uh, we've been lucky enough to work with, with two of the thought leaders in this field, Richard Cole and Johannes Lind, who are going to be speaking with us today. Uh, they are two of the, the leading researchers and practitioners in this new and evolving, rapidly evolving field of, of scaling, not only scaling agricultural technologies, but scaling the impact um, across all sectors. So we're delighted that they're here to speak with us today. Uh, let me give you a little bit of, of background on them before turning over. Uh, Johannes Lin is going to, to kick off with a few introductory remarks. He is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. Uh, before then, he was uh, a vice president of several uh, divisions at the World Bank. Uh, he was the first, the founding director of the Wolfenson Center uh, at Brookings. And in that position, uh, began, developed, uh, implemented a lar uh, uh, one of the first programs, research programs on scaling, working with the World Bank, working with EFAD, the International Food for Fund for Agricultural Development, and other partners. So he will talk to us uh, first about how our scaling efforts sort of fit in the global context. Who else is thinking and working on scaling? And then uh, we will turn over to Richard Cole, uh, who is the founder and principal of the Center for Large Scale Social Change, based in San Francisco. He has been working on uh, strategic thinking, process and systems analysis, and thought partnership and training to support scaling up of high impact innovations in agriculture and many other sectors. So we are going to uh, have Richard and Johannes speak to us for about the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes. We're going to open up for questions at that time, both online and here. Open up for questions at about uh, 9.45. At 10 o'clock, um, as you all know, the administrator will have his town hall from 10 to 11. So many people will break at 10 to allow people who need to go to that to, to leave. Um, we will continue our discussion online here from 10 to 10.30. Um, and for those of you who may remain in the room who want to uh, continue with questions for Richard and Johannes. So Johannes, over to you.
All right, here we start again. I'm Johannes Lin, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, midnight. Uh, great pleasure to be with you today. I uh, must say the fact that USAID is picking up under the leadership of the administrator and uh, Julie in this context, in particular pushing forward the agenda with her team, is uh, fantastic news for us, uh, who's, been, who's been working for a bit, a few years actually, on the Scaling Up agenda. Uh, Brookings, as Julie mentioned, has had a program for the last six or seven years uh, looking at scaling up in development, uh, especially among the development assistance institutions. Uh, we've been working with others like Richard, uh, who's been part of our teams at the time but has his own program. And there are others out there who work on this topic. But in general, so far, they've been, in terms of serious analysis and engagement, relatively few, but we're seeing, as I will mention, quite a actually wave of interest in this topic and with this, I'm sure there will also be more analytical work and support capacity will be built. Now, what we found in our work is that the real challenge isn't that there's no scaling up happening. In fact, all of you, probably in your own programs, or as you look around the last few decades of development, can point out, point out some very wonderful examples of success. Up. Think about the Green Revolution. Think about the Les Plateau program in China. <clears throat> Think about uh, the Green Grameen Bank or many others. What we feel and what we've learned is the real problem is that scaling up is not being done and pursued systematically by the institutions who uh, develop and implement and support development programs. Instead, what you find, the prevailing practice is actually have relatively short-term interventions, one-off interventions, uh, pilots, <clears throat> which I would like to often refer to as pilots to nowhere, because in fact nothing happens after you've finished with your pilot. There's no real serious evaluation, no serious building on the experience, and then scaling, replicating, and scaling up. If there were more scaling up, and especially more systematic scaling up, we believe that, in fact, the development impact of uh, actions on the ground, of uh, aids uh, supported programs and so on, could be much more significant uh, than it has been. It's always interesting to observe that somewhere around 75% of all aid-assisted pro projects and programs are rated sac satisfactory as a, uh, during evaluations. But then if you look in the macro analysis of the impact of aid, you find the impact tends to be quite negligible. And so the question is, where is this disconnect? Well, I think the disconnect is because too many of our interventions are one-off, are short-term, are pilots nowhere. And the challenge we all have is to now systematically, over time, figure out a way to move from successful pilots to successful interventions to replicate and scale up. The good news is that actually, I think we've learned quite a lot about what successful scaling up means. We have a framework, a simple framework of analysis looking back and of su supporting analysis looking forward that can help in programming. And there's now, and that's the second point in terms of good news, there's much more greater recognition uh, in the development community that scaling up is mission critical as actually at IFAT uh, they, they put it. E uh, scaling up is mission critical. Uh, we've been working with various institutions now, and uh, let me quickly summarize, because I think it's indicative of the fact that you guys aren't alone in grappling with this challenge of scaling up. Uh, with IFAT, our work's been most intensive. We've now worked with them for four or five years, try and systematically integrate scaling up into their institutional DNA, if you wish. And I think there's some progress that's being made. We've worked with IFAT, with the World Bank, with Hyper International, and with IFPRI on scaling up in agriculture. And of course, we're working with you guys now. We've worked with UNDP and a African Development Bank on integrating scaling up into their country systems programs and strategies. We've worked with USAID and GIZ in developing uh, guidelines for the staff to how actually do the scaling up in their operations. We worked with USAID, not your group, but on another, with another group on scaling up in youth programs. With OSAID, okay, I'm sorry. With OSAID and African Development Bank, we worked on scaling up in fragile states, which is, by the way, a, a, a topic which I think is very important indeed, because in fragile states, it may be more difficult to scale up, but it's just as essential, if not even more so. We've worked with JICA on the interface between public-private sector in scaling up 
on incentives for scaling up and South-South cooperation for scale of impact. In short, I only mention this because it shows you, I hope, that there's actually a lot of interest in this, uh, in this agenda. And as you look around now, uh, on the ground, I think you'll find increasingly partners who will be working with you on a scaling up agenda. Now, Richard will talk a lot bit more about the whys and the hows and, uh, and the whats that uh, are involved in scaling up what we've learned. In conclusion, I just want to say that uh, I'm delighted you're all thinking about this issue and addressing it. I'm hoping that it will become mission critical for USAID also, the scaling up agenda, not just in agriculture, but actually I would hope across the board, and not just as a one-off sort of short-term interest of this particular administration and this particular administrator, but actually a long-term uh, agenda that USID takes on board, because I think only then will it make a real difference. Thank you. So uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I've been working on scaling up for about first with Management Systems International that some of you are familiar with, and that out on my own. Um, and we can talk more about that later. I just want to make it clear, what, what is it we're talking about when we're talking about scaling up? I, I think there's a tendency. Uh, the World Bank under Wilkinson actually organized a major conference in 2005 in Shanghai. And there's a two-volume uh, set if you uh, have trouble sleeping at night. Uh, Take a look at that. And uh, it, you know, they reach about 500 pages. And I've read the whole thing. And I tried to think about what is the in common of all these studies. The only thing I could come up with as a definition of scaling up that would encompass everything that was in those two volumes was scaling up means doing more. Okay, So I'd like to refine that a little bit more, no pun intended, uh, because that's not what we're talking about here. There's a tendency also to see uh, scaling up as mostly quantitative. Now we're reaching 2,000 farmers. In three years, we're going to be reaching 4,000 farmers. Now we're reaching uh, 50,000 hectares are covered with this rice variety, double that, triple that, well, some quantitative increase. And certainly, what I will globally put those things under, whether it's hectares, farmers, demographic groups, locations, however you want to slice it, what I'll call reach is a key element of scaling. Okay. It's necessary, but it's far from sufficient. I want to make it clear that, for at least for the rest of this morning, and for those of you I'm going to be working with the next few days, uh, scaling also includes scaling impact. There is a, a market tendency, as we go to scale, for impact to decline. And there's a close relationship between what they call in the jargon fidelity, which is that, especially now, and I am also welcome this, that there has been a dramatic increase in the rigor of evaluate, monitoring and evaluation, even to the point of using RCTs in some of our programs. Um, we now have a pretty good sense of what we did that caused these outcomes. But when we go to scale, there's a tendency to be output driven, or to go to the 4,000 people of the 4,000 hectares, as opposed to saying, are we actually replicating the program, the model, the intervention, the innovation, whatever you want to call it, in the same way we did it at, at small scale? And there is actually a tension with that, because often if we are moving to new locations, or in this particular context, different agroecological zones, different demographic groups, for example, from uh, high upland farmers to lowland farmers or whatever, the social context or the institutional context may change. And we may have to somewhat adapt the program to work effectively in those areas. So there's actually one of the key trade-offs in scaling up is between fidelity to what we know works at small scale and adaptation to what works at large scale. Okay? The second third part of scaling up, in addition to reach and impact, is equity or coverage. There's a tendency to use existing pathways. And what do I mean by pathway? Well, for example, the government agricultural extension system, NGOs that are providing technical assistance, uh, the private sector value chain that provides inputs or output upstream or downstream from farmers. Okay? Those are all pathways. But what we heard, in, for those of you uh, who are aware, there was a glee for this Feed the Future scaling up in both Bangkok and Addis. And uh, it was quite remarkable to me that one of the women who presented, who runs a seed company in India, says that the, the potential market for her seeds is 46 million people. But it's too expensive for her to deliver to 26 million of those because they're too small, they have too low of an income to buy her seeds, and they're too far away. It would take someone a half a day or a day to go to the little tiny village, 
by bicycle or motorcycle. The point of that anecdote is that if we use existing pathways, what tends to happen is we reproduce the inequities that already exist in service delivery. In other words, right now, people who have money or purchasing power tend to get goods and services, and people who don't, don't. But I think we're in the development business and the, and the poverty alleviation business. So in a sense, one of the key challenges is how do we scale up when the existing pathways we have tend to be biased to replicating the inequities in access that already exist. Okay. Um, one, so I've already uh, outlined that there's a trade-off between fidelity and adaptation and between scale and impact. And the last one is cost. Okay. We don't have infinite resources. And whether the ultimate scale that we're talking about will be financed by uh, the private sector in the sense that farmers will pay for goods and services, or by public sector funding, or by some combination of social enterprises, et cetera, et cetera, um, we do have some sort of challenge of unit cost. Can farmers afford these seats? Uh, can this fit within the ag extension budget? Whatever the budget constraint is, and obviously, in terms of impact and scale, especially reaching the poorest of the poor who are often remote, there's a trade-off between costs. And I guess uh, since I know not everybody is a, an American, um, but uh, since many people have been exposed to American culture, I like to call this the Apollo 13 problem. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, um, they get 99 million miles to the moon. They're almost there. The life support system breaks, and um, they have to fix it within 36 hours, which is before they can get back to the Earth. They put a bunch of engineers in a room, and they say, this is what they've got on board. You have 36 hours to come up with a fix. This is not best practice. This is optimizing within the given constraints. So in scaling up, we have a number of constraints. We have, this is the model and the impact we want to have. This is the scale we want to reach. These are the existing pathways that could, an organizational capacity in particular to deliver to the population we want to reach. And last but not least, there are financial and human resource constraints. Okay? Often the existing capabilities of those pathways and organizations at scale do not match what is what the model or the innovation required at small scale. It's one thing to have a contract or an RFP for a COP and an implementer with you know, their budget for three, five years or a few million dollars. What they can do is not necessarily the same as what a large scale system and, and similarly, the financial resources may not be similar. So how do we achieve scale with impact within the constraints that we have? That's the, that's the, that's the challenge that we all face. Okay. Now, just one last word on that. Uh, some of you may have heard of this uh, mythical place in American culture called Lake Wobegon. Okay. So um, at scale, one, one of the things I love and hate about USAID programs is that you hire the best people to run them, and they do a fantastic job. The problem is I'm never sure whether we're testing the efficacy of a model or the efficacy of a really good COP and five team members who are great problem solvers. And basically, what I think we may have be testing is that if you get a team like that and you give them five or ten million dollars for five years, they will produce results no matter what happens. Those people are above average. The only place where you can work at scale where everybody is above average is Lake Wobegon, okay, where all the children are above average. Okay? But at scale, by definition, when you go from 5 or 10 or 50 people implementing to thousands of people implementing for Statistics 101, is that we are working at average, right? Those are the people. So can it be implemented by the existing system, maybe with some capacity and capability building, but experience shows that the larger the gap between what you need to do to strengthen that system to deliver at scale, the more time and effort and resources it takes. And so. Some of the EFED programs that Johannes referred to, especially in Africa, have in fact built those systems, but they've often occurred over two or three project life cycles, over a 10 or 15 year period. And so, uh, if, especially in this case, where we're often talking about at least trying to get the um, critical mass, I think is the jargon we're using, for scaling in often a one or two or three year period, to some extent, the amount of system building we can do in that period is very limited. Okay. The last point I'd uh, like you to take away, um, I'm sort of trying to give the, the big picture, and then we'll try to get into as many details as we have time for, is that, in my opinion, there are basically three issues that come up as the major challenges in, in, in scaling. First is incentives or motivation. And I'm using that word 
in the broadest sense of the word. Or you could use, whether you call it politics, if, it's, if you're working in the public sector, we could call it politics, both policymakers, political parties, but also internal bureaucratic politics. Who is going to do this? Is this the, the, what's the political interest of the various stakeholders? And why would they get on board? If we're working with the value chain, what's the business case for the private sector to get involved? Are they going to make money? Is this their target market? Um, is it how, what's the risk? They're making those evaluations. Farmers, right? Why should they buy into this model? Okay. If we don't align incentives in all those sectors, public, private, the beneficiaries or participants themselves, and, and in my opinion, the interface in particular between often frontline service delivery, people who are providing agricultural machinery services, people selling seeds, uh, people providing agricultural extension, and the farmers themselves, and probably the wholesalers who are buying from the farmers or retailers, that nexus in particular, if all those people don't see it in their interest to do, quote unquote, the right thing, then this doesn't work. And that's where often breakdowns occur. And particularly one of the big challenges we have uh, working in anti-poverty and agriculture is we can see as experts objective need, but that doesn't necessarily translate into felt need or actual demand by farmers or others. Okay? So how do so often it's not just a question of supplying services or seeds or technology, et cetera, but it's actually generating demand. Okay? And how do we get that to, and spreading demand, not just for the critical mass, but how do we, how do we go uh, beyond that? The second one I've already alluded to is implementation capacity at scale. Uh, we all know that government systems are weak. I already alluded to the fact that often private sector systems don't have an incentive to deal with the poor, despite the trendiness of the, the, uh, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, as we know now from microfinance, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid often only goes down to about $5 a day or if we're lucky, four or three, but not two or one, which is, I think, the real target population. And last but not least, the fiscal constraint. Okay, how do we do all of this in a way that's affordable? All right. So one of the things I really want to emphasize, and I think you've already picked up on this, is that um, Julia referred to doing, doing a new kind of business. And I think one of the challenges for scaling is that the, it's very difficult to do scaling with any old programmatic model. When I've worked with USAID programs and other donor programs in the past on scaling, often scaling doesn't even get thought of until year three, four, five, or even the last six months. And in other fields, uh, particularly global health, they often talk about research into practice. So we've done something two, three, four years. Now in the last six months, we're going to put out the nice five, 10, 20 page glossy with the pictures of the smiling kids and the farmers and the wheat and the wheat. And then we're going to hold the two day seminar. And then, uh, and all of, everybody's going to come. And everybody said, wow, this is great, and we're going to integrate this into our strategy. And six months later, it's in the national agricultural strategy or health strategy or education strategy, and we declare victory and go home. Well, research into practice, in my opinion, actually, as, as Johannes kind of alluded to, also stands for rest in peace, okay? which is basically this program has now died, and we've buried it. We've got a nice burial, and it's in the national strategy. But when you come back five years later, there is nothing there. So in addition to reach, impact, and equity, the fourth dimension of, yes, scaling up takes us into the fourth dimension, for those who like that, uh, is sustainability, which is what happens two, three, five, ten years ago after we're there. And for me, sustainability has three different aspects. First is political. Uh, again, I'm sure this never happens in USAID or the US government. I'm American, by the way. But in other countries, OK, when administrations change, when secretaries change, when ministers change, their political incentive is to do something completely different. Okay? And one of the challenges in scaling up is the easiest way to scale up, usually, whether it's public sector or private sector pathway, is to find one or more champions okay, who have power, influence, decision makers, access to resources. The problem with that is when those champions disappear, what happens next? Especially if the next champion or the next person in that slot actually wants to do something different. So how do we build long-term political sustainability? Secondly is what I call organizational uh, sustainability or capacity. Often, uh, if the rest in peace program isn't done, the better version of the rest in peace program is, we've piloted this in, pick your, pick your poison, three districts, three blocks, 5,000 people, this pop size population. We will help actor X, maybe it's the public sector, scale it up. So we're going to provide training for, let's say, 5,000, 10,000 ag extension workers, or whoever the delivery system is. Okay? In many countries, 
turnover is dramatic, okay, uh, of who these people are. So what will happen is two, three, five years later, though, you pick the number, 10, 20, 30, As I was saying, um, several years later, there will be substantial turnover in human resources. Uh, and if we haven't built training capacity, then actually those people will not know what we have access to this program. Okay? And that's doubly important, and I, and I want to throw this out as a challenge, because my question to all of us is we're scaling up, at least in this particular uh, forum, agricultural technology. But are we scaling up a particular technology, a version of rice, a version of access to certain types of pumping technologies or irrigation technologies or deep fertilizer placement? Or are we scaling up the ability to adapt and adopt innovative technology? What if there's a new version of rice in three years? Can the supply chain, the seed producers, the et cetera, et cetera, you know, bring that to their country, adapt it to local conditions and sell it to the farmer? Or um, or are we, are we going to come back in 20 years? And yes, it went to scale, but they're still using the same seed variety that they were using 20 years ago. And we have to run another project every 10 years, every time there's a technological innovation, because the system itself is not capable of implementing that. So that's two dimensions of organi organizational sustainability, is the ability to learn and change, whether it's updating curriculum, uh, adapting and constantly innovating, adapting new technologies, or developing new human resources, et cetera, et cetera. And the last is um, financial sustainability, which is, of course, the issue of when the donor money goes away, whether it's USAID or others, what happens? And I think you're all familiar with that one. One of the other issues I want to highlight on is not only is it different from programs because we need to think about, I mean, projects, a more programmatic approach. Are we building systems, which might take over one, two, three uh, project cycles? But there's a difference in project management for uh, normal project management for scaling up. Scaling up is almost always nonlinear and iterative, right? One of the things that I've emphasized is the ability to um, make political and, the political and organizational roadblocks in scaling up and, how, and the fact that you need to address them. One of the things I would hope you would take away from this talk is that it's actually helpful to, to think about scaling from the beginning and start with the end in mind. Uh, which is something I'm borrowing from a, a close colleague, a woman named Ruth Simmons, who's actually done a lot of work on scaling and global health and has co-authored a uh, framework on, on scaling up, which has been published by the WHO. And um, I can give you that reference. Uh, it's also in the slides at the end of the slide. Okay. The point about starting with, with the end in mind is that we want to think about which pathway are we going to scale up through from the beginning so that we can test in that pathway. And also, we can start to mobilize those stakeholders to buy in, have ownership, and support this early in the process. It's, it's another thing. That's what the rest in peace problem is. We've, do, we've gone on off and done this by ourselves for five years, or as I like to say, no, we got permission, and we talked to all the stakeholders in the year one, and they signed off. And then we do our own thing, and then we come back and say, look what we did for the last four years. We actually don't want them to sign off. We want them to sign on. Okay. We want them involved in the process so that it, at year three, four, five, it's their program, it's not our program. Okay? And often we need to consider a, it's the Apollo 13 problem, which is iterating on this may be an effective program, but is it politically supported and is it aligned with political incentives, political priorities, policy priorities, whoever the relevant stakeholder is, and how do we adapt that over time? Secondly, there tend to be winners and losers in scaling up, which is not usually the case at scale project. What do I mean by that? You innovate a new seed variety. Well, who is supplying the old seed variety? Do those people lose money? You bring in new technology of new pumps, new irrigation systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who has the vested interest in the, in the existing technology? Okay. There, there's a long, my background, by the way, is in economic history and development. There's a long history in many countries of technology not being adopted because the efficiency gains are offset or too widely dispersed, while the losers from the change in assets values are able to politically block what happens. So we have to think in advance who are the potential losers. And I'll give you a, an example. I've worked a lot 
as, as Julie alluded to, not just in agriculture but health. Um, I've seen a lot of innovations. The big thing these days, I think in many developing sectors, is using community health workers, or what I call task shifting, which is if we haven't got an agricultural extension worker who's professionally trained, has got a master's in agronomy, blah, 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 we teach a local village or a local farmer to deliver because that gives us better human resources and access. Okay. Well, how are the existing agricultural extension workers going to handle that? Are they, are they thrilled that somebody with a 10th grade education is basically taking their job? Do they see that as a supplement to them or as a threat? And particularly in health, with the use of community health workers, local doctors and nurses do perceive it as a threat, um, which is often ironic, actually, because they refuse to work in the poor areas where the services are needed. But the fact that somebody with a 10th grade education is giving injections and maybe even setting bones uh, in a poor village means that that's taking away from the prestige and power of doctors. And I'm speaking from experience where I've actually seen um, medical associations block the, the scaling up of very powerful and important interventions in India and other because they perceive those as threats to their vested interests. Um, the question also is whose job is scaling up? Is it USAID? Is it the government? Is it the farmers associations? And often there's a, there's a tendency for nobody to be in charge precisely because Scaling up is almost always a multi-stakeholder process, right? There's vertical, there's the vertical from the national to the state to the district to the county to the village, whatever the administrative distinction, there's often horizontal, right? We're getting the public sector involved, private sector, other donors, farmers associations, okay? Who, whose job is that to get all those people aligned, right? It's a little bit different than a project mentality. And the other challenge of whose job in it, and this is a really interesting challenge, I find, is often, I've alluded to this before, you have to adapt the model as it goes to scale. Who makes that call? Is it USAID? Is it the people who invented the technology at the research institution or some university in the United States or, or in country? Is it the farmers themselves? Is it the private sector as they adopt it? And remember, we're trying to get fidelity. Okay, are they, are they adopting it because they're dumbing down? Or are they adopting it because actually, adapting it because actually that's what makes it more effective? Very difficult sometimes to make that distinction. Okay, scaling up, as you can imagine, if you're building systems capacity, if you're doing political advocacy or marketing to the private sector, et cetera, takes resources. It's not simply an afterthought that we can do in the last six months or 12 months of our project. It often takes an entire project unto itself, two, three, five years. And as we said from the EFOT experience, sometimes two projects or three projects. Okay, and the skills that it takes, if you can have a scalar upper, by the way, if somebody could come up with a better term for that, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, I often call it an inter the intermediary role. There's small scale, there's large scale. Whose job is it to go from small to large? It takes a, a different skill set. It takes advocacy, marketing skills, boundary spanning, um, convening power. Can you get all the stakeholders in the room? What's the skill set to align incentives? That's not usually a degree in agronomy or veterinary science, or for that matter, even though we talk the talk, most economists talk a lot about incentives, but I'm not sure they actually know how to do it in the field. Okay. So um, how do you actually do that in practice? Okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go over a few things. There's a lot of different ways, to types of scaling up. And the couple of the distinctions I want to make is between horizontal and vertical, which is horizontal you can think about like from farmer to farmer, okay, versus vertical can be top down. So it says the government or, or somebody else sort of tries to roll this out. Um, often they go together. Uh, which is who's going to run the farmer to farmer. And you can also think about it as demand driven or supply driven, which is and managed or not managed. So one of the types of scaling up that we all love, but it doesn't always happen, is farmers see the guy next door or the woman next door uh, implementing a new thing and they spontaneously do it. So that would be a horizontal, demand driven, spontaneous. Unfortunately, that, that best case often doesn't happen and scaling up has to be managed. Somebody has to push it. It actually has to go out and talk to the farmers, supply driven, and that often requires a vertical component. So which mix or match of these types is actually important or going to work in the context we're working? Okay. The framework that Johannes and uh, a colleague of his, Arna Hartman, developed, um, which I'd like to think I put in my two cents on, um, thank you, um, is what we call the driver's spaces and pathway. And that's the one we're going to be using for Feed the Future scaling up. But I think it's, it's not a sexually specific model, it's a generic model. The notion is we have an innovation and we have a vision of scale. And we've talked about that. Reach, impact, equity, uh, sustainability. 
And the question is, how do we get there? In order to get there, first of all, there has to be space for scaling up. I'm not going to have time to go through all the spaces, but we've talked about fiscal or financial space. Is there money in the budget for this if it's a public sector pathway? Or is, are there private sectors who have the financial resources or can farmers afford to pay? Okay. Organizational capacity, who's going to deliver this? Who's going to deliver the seed? Who's going to um, provide the agricultural extension services? Who's going to deliver the, the um, machinery services to farmers? And not just the front line, but what's the, all the way back up the value chain? Does that exist? The policies, are policies aligned? One of the things that we discovered in Bangkok, uh, for those who were there, is that in many countries, governments either subsidize, heavily subsidize or provide for free existing varieties of seeds. So if we're thinking about scaling up to a private sector pathway, um, is that how can that compete with free seeds, even if the, the new seeds are significantly more powerful and effective and have higher yields, et cetera, et cetera? Is, is the rate of return high enough to offset the free or subsidized seeds? And in several countries, the answer to that is no. I also work, for example, and I'm sure some of you have heard of this, you know, the new cook stove revolution. I think uh, every university that I've been to in the last five years has got a cook stove that somehow works in a village in rural developing countries, okay? In many countries, kerosene or carbon or charcoal is subsidized. They can't roll out the cook stove because of distortions in the energy market, okay? So is there policy space to scale this up and if it's, et cetera? Political space we've talked about and that we can include both um, do political parties, do vested interests and multi-stakeholders, are incentives aligned? And last but not least, is there partnership space? Very difficult, even with the resources of USAID, to scale up by yourself. Okay? So who else do we need to engage in this? And are those partners available or are their interests? If this space exists already, that's great, but often it doesn't, in which case space has to be created. That's part of an intermediary function that somebody has to fill. USAID project, an intermediary organization, a collective effort, a multi-stakeholder partnership with the government or other donors, etc. In order to create that space and to move this scaling up agenda along, we have drivers. I've already alluded to some, which is who's going to be the champion? What incentives are there that we could leverage already? Or can we align with policies or private sector incentives? Is there demand that can we take into that? Well, what's going to drive the scaling up process? Okay. And how can we monitor that uh, to make sure we're on track? And I want to emphasize the importance of monitoring uh, because monitoring, because scaling up is political, monitoring actually feeds back into the advocacy and marketing effort. It's not simply for due diligence and accountability for the money we're spending, but actually having things like scorecards, like we're at 5,000 farmers, we're at 10,000 farmers, um, so that various stakeholders, basically monitoring is part of your advocacy effort. And so one of the things that we want to do is actually add indicators to our monitoring system that we can use, call it what you want, strategic communications, media outreach, marketing, advocacy, to build support, generate critical mass and momentum for scaling up. Okay. So in my remaining few minutes, um, this is how I usually think of what scaling up looks like. Okay. First of all, is it scalable? For me, often the question is not so much thumbs up, thumbs down, but how do we make it more scalable? And I'll flash a slide that gives you some of the criteria in a minute, but we won't really have time to talk about it. What's the model? Okay, We all like to think that we're scaling up technologies, but technologies don't exist in a vacuum. They're embedded in social systems and delivery systems, etc. And particularly, uh, as uh, Johannes alluded to, I think about uh, models or innovations as having a what and a how. Okay. Actually, because of the work that I've done with uh, IFAD and Johannes and Brookings on uh, agricultural scaling, one of the most important issues that is going to be addressed is how do we innovate agricultural extension services since many public sector systems are broken or ineffective or have limited scope. And one of the problems with those systems, as I'm sure you all know, is that the tenancy is high. I'm your agricultural extension agent. I am a genius and have all the knowledge. You are an ignorant, stupid farmer. And let me tell you what you need to do. You need to buy 200 kilos, kilos of fertilizer for your hectare and 30 kilos of seed and all this kind of stuff. And the farmer says, well, actually, I only have enough money to do half of that. OK, so how do I, what, what's the best way for me to spend my money? And the answer is, if you're not going to take my advice and do it right, it just shows, it confirms my opinion of you being stupid, ignorant, and dumb. OK, not surprising, that isn't very effective. OK, so just if we 
get agricultural extension agents to have new updated knowledge doesn't necessarily, it's not what they say, it's how they say it. Are they client driven or are they supply driven? Okay. And one of the interesting innovations that EFED has scaled up, at least in Peru and a few other places, is actually creating a private sector market for agricultural extension services where they train local people to be providers, they give grants to local communities, and then the communities hire them. If the extension workers don't deliver, they never get more work. So it forces a different process of being client-centered, demand-driven, sensitive to farmers' concern, as opposed to talking at them, which tends to characterize traditional um, uh, service providers. So it's not simply that they have different or better knowledge, but they actually work differently. We found the same thing in health. Okay? Teaching nurses and doctors new technology is great, but if a woman comes in for family planning services and is shamed and humiliated uh, by the, the service provider, she doesn't come back. Okay? So, and that's also true in education. Uh, often the most important innovations in education are pedagogical. It's not the curriculum that changes, it's how teachers teach it. And teaching the, and scaling up these invisible, these tacit, intangible elements tend to get dropped at scale, because it's easy to monitor the quantity stuff, the technology stuff, the qualitative process, intangible stuff is much harder. Okay? What's the small scale context? So the next question we ask is, given this innovation, um, what does it take to do that? What are the capabilities required organizationally? Because we don't, to replicate the model, we have to replicate the ability to deliver that model. Okay? We want to back out or reverse engineer from the model components, the components to what does it take to do it so we can make sure we replicate or reproduce those at scale. What was the external environment? Okay, is it male farmers or women farmers? Do women farmers have power? Do they have econo access to economic assets? If we're going from a place where women can get access to, let's say, microfinance to a place where they don't, that is a, a key environmental and systemic uh, thing. I know we all do results frameworks or logical frameworks in our models, but somehow in the 30 years, or 40 years now, I guess, since they've been invented, there's a tendency for the assumptions column to somehow drop off the picture. Okay? In scaling up, we can't do that, because these external assumptions that, that make our logical chain work effectively are key. Okay? We train a farmer or an extension worker to do something, and the, you know, that's the output, and, and therefore they adopt the technology, that's the outcome. Okay? Only works if these external assumptions hold. We move to a new place where those assumptions don't hold, we don't have anything. Okay, so being clear on what those are. Goals we've already talked about, um, analyzing the spaces we've talked about, and then choosing roles and pathways. So given the spaces, and this is the iterative part, is ideally we'd like to have this model scaled up, but these people can't, this large scale system can't do it, and so maybe we need to either change the model or change the pathway. And so actually what I'm going to go to is a little graphic, which I think might be helpful. Oh, sure. sure. We do have a couple of questions from online. Uh, Suzanne Poland here in BFF asked, what are the pros and cons of starting at scale rather than scaling up? Um, and then Evan Meyer with USAID Nepal asked, how do you work with donor systems in scaling up to incorporate, as you described, nonlinear and iterative systems within donor linear systems. I'm Adam Reinhardt from um, USAID's um, Office of Food for Peace. And my question is about um, uh, sort of farmer-driven stuff, the horizontal, which I think is far more powerful than the uh, other one. I really appreciate what you said about incentives. I've certainly worked in my own project development to install those in every project that we do, get the incentives right that follows. The ability for donors to do everything, right? There's just not enough money, there's not enough of us in the world 
So the part where you were talking about sort of the, it was seemed very heavy, heavy focus on the implementers. When in fact the only way we're ever going to really get to scale is by having one farmer or one person teach another person. And so what, what we're trying to do now in Food for Peace is we're trying to do what I like to refer to as self-transferring, self-financing mechanisms. So not only do they pay for themselves, but then they move of their own accord. And we're trying to work with our implementing partners to figure out how to sort of install these models that then grow and have a life of their own outside of the donor community altogether. And there's some examples of this in the world. The redreaming in Sahel is one of my favorite examples of it, where we've actually seen this happen with very, very limited donor involvement in the beginning. And they may be slow, but they're slow and steady. Yeah, Paul Randolph with, I'm the director for East Asia and Pacific, the Asia Bureau at USAID. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I mean, I think this, uh, you've, you've packaged up this issue really well. Um, my question is, in your research and analysis, uh, now that there's a lot of discussion of like mobile technologies and how we can use IT and other solutions, um, have you looked at that and is there any evidence to show how it can be used to help in the scaling process? Uh, well, thank you for the great questions. Um, taking them from the top, um, starting at scale is expensive. Um, I mean, first of all, one of the questions I almost always get is, when should you start scaling or thinking about scaling? And I guess the short answer to that is after proof of concept. I do think that there's something to be said for, okay, we're going to work in three villages or you know, ten districts or whatever it is, whatever small scale looks like, and say, does this work at all or not? Uh, and then build in scaling from there. Um, I don't think it makes, I, I also think that scaling is a learning process. It's often done in a phased way, particularly if you're scaling in situations where you do think changes in context will be occurring. In other words, we're going to move from, as we move from this district or this province or this region to others or from this population to others, we're going to be learning things. And I often like to think of scaling often as, uh, for those of you familiar with it, as a spider plant, sort of sending out the shoots to the new areas testing to see if it works in those new areas, and then sort of using those as centers of excellence or demonstration projects, et cetera. Um, there are some cases, however, where starting at scale can make sense, and that's particularly true uh, with economies of scale. Uh, so for example, one of the projects I've worked on is a micro-insurance project, okay? Micro-insurance projects actually don't work unless you have sufficient numbers to defray the risk, as we're learning in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so, um, often you have to start at significant scale to do that. The other advantage of that is that you do get buy-in by the large-scale players from the beginning. Um, the problem is that you often aren't, it's, there's a tendency not to have learning at large scale and, and to and fix mistakes. And making mistakes at that scale can be very expensive. So I think the, re, the, the tension is, yes, by starting at large scale we can get buy-in and ownership and we're also testing in the large-scale system so the issues of politics and implementation capacity that I alluded to, to some extent are built in from the start. The problem is that, that, scale, that those types of things tend to be path dependent. In the sense that you make a mistake at large scale, or this is the program at large scale, it turns out it's not working. It's not so easy to fix it after the fact. It's much easier to fix it as you go to scale. Um, linear and nonlinear, boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think that... You know, this is really going to be a challenge. I mean, I think one of the things we really have to think about is whether the old ways of doing business are going to work. Um, on the one hand, um, I think a challenge, you know, I think one of the great things about USAID and other donors is increasingly internal accountability. We're going to deliver to 50,000 farmers this year or 500,000 hectares or whatever the numbers are in the next five years. But if we're scaling with partners, we lose control. We can't hit those targets by ourselves. We aren't completely responsible, okay? Or, and we may have to adjust them if the, if the partners aren't delivering. So how do we build into our systems, I think, the, the current heavy emphasis on accountability and delivery, which I think is great, on the one hand, and the fact that as we're scaling and working with multiple partners, we're no longer in control, okay? And this ownership issue is key, and I think that's the balance we're going to have to achieve. I think another place where this shows up, by the way, is monitoring and evaluation, which is I think monitoring and evaluation for scale are very different than monitoring and evaluation for accountability. Um, there are very few projects that I know generate the kind of accounting data that we need, particularly for scaling through the private sector. 
All right? Your, your accounting systems aren't driven to say, what's the unit cost and how much money can I make of delivering this seed? They're driven for, did I hit the budget targets on um, you know, infrastructure, short-term PA, uh, overhead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what a private sector person wants to see. Okay, so how do we generate that? Um, the next question was from you, sir, uh, which was um, the importance of farmer to farmer. I think that's exactly right. I mean, to the extent that we can do that, that's fantastic. And, and that leads me to two comments. One is, often when I see a model documented, they never document the incentives and how they address them. In other words, how do you, how did you get farmers to, no, not get, that's the wrong word, but what was that, is it that farmers actually saw? Okay. I was just in working in China for EFAD last year, almost uh, about nine months ago. One of the things that went to scale, believe it or not, is guinea pig ranches. Okay. Uh, and they don't use them for pets. Okay. So why did other farmers get a, Why did the adopt, other adopting farmers do it? It turns out that what they saw in the originating farmer was not the guinea pigs and all that. They saw that she was buying new clothes, a new car, and a new house. And they said, okay, if she's got new consuming power, what is it she's doing? Okay. And, um, I, and as much as we would like to think that this kind of dissemination uh, it works spontaneously, sometimes um, creating peer-to-peer -peer learning groups or facilitating that process, creating farmer networks, which I know the Senegal Project is doing and others, uh, creating some of the institutional framework to allow that spontaneity to occur um, uh, can be helpful. And I think we haven't fully analyzed why farmers field schools seem to be better to sort of catalyze the kind of dan uh, demand-driven uh, scaling we're talking about versus demonstration projects versus farmer networks. Or whether, what, uh, why some of these things seem to work better in some situations than others. So I agree with you 100%, but I think we can be a little bit more scientific about how actually do you catalyze. And, and one of the criteria for scaling that we know, which I didn't have a chance to look at, and I can't uh, go in the right direction here, is that scaling needs to be credible, observable, and relevant. Okay? Prove that it works, not just because it's statistically significant by a, a, of an agronomist, but what is it, what is it, we know it works, what does the farmer have to see? Can he observe that, and is it relevant to his or her needs? Okay, so can we actually try to get our, help, uh, get them there? Um, just because I'd like to give uh, others a chance to respond, I'm going to pass on the mobile technology, and maybe Johannes or Emma can take a minute. Ah, okay. The green light should be on. Okay. Sorry, let me start with a question on pros and cons of, uh, cons of starting at scale. In uh, thinking about scaling up, uh, we actually think about two possible types of errors. One is you don't scale up what works. The other is you actually do scale up or we're put at scale the wrong, the wrong thing or you do it in the wrong way. Now, my alma mater, the World Bank, has actually a long history of scaling up in the wrong way and you know, doing things at a large scale that haven't necessarily been properly tested, that take a long time to prepare, uh, years, and by the time you actually get to do it, the situation has changed, even though the program or project you're supporting uh, is now perfectly designed for the conditions two or three years ago. And in the meantime, the, the beneficiaries actually haven't seen any benefits and therefore, in a way, have walked away and got disenchanted. So there are real risks of trying to go in at large scale uh, with something that hasn't yet been proven, where you actually don't know whether, what is the model and whether it works. You don't really know whether the institutions are there. And you actually miss an opportunity to get the buy-in of both potential beneficiaries, the political uh, stakeholders, and as well as your partners. So I think in many cases, it's probably better to start 
uh, small, or at least start in a way so you can properly test the model. A perfect example of this is the uh, uh, conditional cash transfer program in Mexico that actually took five to ten years to build from model to the national stage uh, and actually it's been written up very nicely as a, as a case study. Uh, so in the end you had the national program but you actually built up rather carefully over time. At times of course, and this is the final comment on this question, I think uh, Julie likes to remind us, we've actually done all this testing and so on. So let's not start from the beginning again just because uh, you know, we have a mindset, well we've got to start with a model. But actually make sure you look at the evidence of where it's worked, how it's worked, and what the various components of successful scaling up may be, and then move right in. And I think that's what Julie, I think, is hoping, actually, in many of her programs, that you already have a lot of experience. You actually have done a lot of testing. You've got a lot of pilots. Now just build on those and systematically figure out a way to go relatively quickly over the next two to three years to scale. The only point I would add Make sure whatever you do, it's number one, sustainable, and number two, to extend the scale you reach after two or three years, that you actually have built up a, me a mechanism that takes it to e an even larger scale because in most cases you probably won't have reached the sort of 100% of optimal scale that you are ideally aiming for. The uh, other point on the question of um, so the, the pharma-driven uh, approaches, I think that's actually a wonderful pathway that for certain cases will work beautifully. The, we've worked with the EFAT on a program in Peru, Highland, uh, Highland Development Program, which is exactly that. It was basically pharma driven. It was a pathway that incorporated key elements and over 30 years actually has done a remarkably good job in, in pursuing that. The regreening exercise uh, example that you mentioned is another case that actually um, I think is, is not as far yeah. along but various aspects of this have actually been written up by uh, one of our colleagues in IFPI policy brief that do take very active focus on key elements of the scaling up pathway conditions that we talked about. For example, communication outreach. Uh, in this particular case of, of, of regreening that, that we reviewed, communication and different forms of communication were absolutely critical, which leads me to the final point, uh, mobile technology. Obviously, mobile technology can have, and I think you guys are probably here in USAID further along than many others. IFAD, for example, has not yet, I think, really done a lot of work with this. But in rural credit, in rural market information, and in disseminating information about technologies and providing for feedback from what actually works, and gathering information for monitoring evaluation from the ground up that's actually reliable, that's, uh, that's uh, current and up to date, I think there's uh, tremendous potential and it links directly with pathways for scaling up that where the ICT dimension can and should feed into it. Yeah, uh, a couple of things that Johannes had just uh, uh, provoked uh, some additional thoughts on my part. One is often even though we talk about scaling up technologies, we're actually, that's not really true or it's only partially true. Um, Many of the technologies we're scaling up are not things that are all that new. In fact, uh, uh, one of the challenges of scaling up is not this, there's not a shortage of innovations out there. There's often stuff that's been on the shelf 5, 10, 20 years that isn't being widely used or disseminated. And actually, the innovation on the ground is often in the delivery system. How do we get it out there? Okay. So it's often difficult to, t you don't want to be testing delivery systems at large scale. You really want to see that works. Um, the other piece is in terms of this farmer to farmer piece, which is that's great for certain types of things as Johanna said, but a lot of the work that we're doing here is embedded in value chains and often includes strengthening other parts of the value chain. Most of the time, farmers are not capable of doing that themselves. If their finance, you know, if finance is missing, if a feed supply is missing, if there's monopsonies or multiple layers of buyers on the, on the downstream side, that very little of the value goes to farmers, that's not something that farmers can spread. And so to the extent, and you, whether you want to call it a value chain uh, or, or part of the spaces, of spaces and drivers, or maybe you could call value chains a space, I don't know. Um, if scaling up requires some of that system strengthening or filling in some of the misses, missing pieces, 
of the value chain, then that's something that farmers simply can't do. Or unless you're talking about organizing farmers associations or farmers networks, and again, then somebody has to do that. So um, I think, as, as Johanna said, there is a limited set, an important set of, of innovations that can go to scale that way, but not only does that process need to be often facilitated, but, but other parts of the system simply aren't amenable to that kind of challenge. So any other burning questions? I'm Judy Payne, um, USAID ICT Advisor for Ag. I just wanted to mention that I'll be giving a webinar in our scaling series on a, many uses of ICT beyond mobile as well to help in our scaling processes. Good advertisements are permitted. Okay. Uh, yeah, is this fine? Uh, I'm Jim Yasmin, Bureau of Food Security. You know, we're talking. This is a. Uh, the focus is on poverty alleviation and raising the numbers of smallholder farmers using certain technologies. But, you know, we also have to remember that um, we're dealing with value chains, the end market intermediaries of which, in many cases, would like to see fewer farmers. And um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by, um, Dr. Cole, you being an economic historian. If you look at some of the, the um, value chains in the U.S., for instance, the dairy industry in the U.S., um, about 30 years ago, we had 250,000 dairy farmers in the U.S. We're now down to about 65,000. Yet if you go to the dairy case in any supermarket, we have more products, and the cost of those products is equal to or less than it was 25 years ago. And that's really, you know, that's, that, that was a process that involved adoption of technologies at farm level, but it also involved fewer farmers, more um, capitalized farmers, more efficient farmers. Aren't we going to see the same process in, in uh, the countries that we're dealing with and the sectors that we're dealing with in some of these countries? Wow, scaling and structural transformation all in one question. Yeah, I know you both, you both are up to that. Any other questions? Okay, anything from the online and then we'll, we'll turn it back to you all while you think about structural transformation quickly. Um, uh, Brian Mabelis with USAID Zambia asks, how do we truly know if a, a scaling model works? Do we have to uh, do a rigorous impact evaluation of the model first, or are just a few years of good results enough? The, the, the question on the, um, uh, sorry, yeah, the structural transformation. Um, no, I just lost my train of thought. Okay. Sorry. I don't even... So on, uh, the impact evaluation is a tricky one, um, and especially because we don't live in a perfect world. Okay, um, and so it depends who you talk to. If you talk to Esther Duflo, uh, we need a randomized controlled trial, and we don't want to move until we get the results. For those of you who don't know, Esther is a co-founder of Poverty Action Lab. Uh, on the other hand, often, particularly when you're working in, in partnership with policymakers in country, policymakers have a certain timeline, and often there's also a certain window. Uh, uh, in other words, this issue is going to be hot for two, three, five years. I mean, things are fatty in international development, and you often can't wait five or ten years for the the best results to come in. So you need to move. On the other hand, as uh, Johanna alluded to, we don't want to make type one errors. We don't want to scale up stuff that doesn't work. So I. I don't, I'm just trying to avoid the question, but I think the short answer is it depends. Um, and what does it depend on? I think if, if there's urgency in terms of political priorities, in other words, this minister, this window, there's a funding opportunity here, we have to move, and we can't wait, then I think the short answer is if you've got enough to show that it's promising and maybe some midterm reviews or something like that, then I think you have to go with what you've got, but I wouldn't stop, I wouldn't stop the evaluation. Uh, and I don't want to see those final results. And despite the fact that a few minutes ago I said it's often difficult to change course once you're at scale if your final evaluations are showing something different. On the other hand, if you have the time, I do think that actually having the rigorous data is important. What 
I think is more important, though, what I'd really like to emphasize is we don't want to just know that something works. We want to know why it works and where it works and how it works for scaling. And that's for several reasons. First of all, when was the last time you read an evaluation that said, this worked really well, but it worked because there were certain external conditions that were present. And if those are not present in other places that we go at scale, this will not work. I've probably read a thousand evaluations in my life, and I have never seen that, okay, in evaluation in terms of what's the role of external context. So in this particular area, there are agricultural uh, machinery services that were available. Those were a key but environmental factor. There's access to seeds. There's uh, a wholesale market, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Sometimes we know that stuff intuitively, but it's never documented. Okay? So I think for scaling, part of the role of evaluation is not simply impact, but it's also external environment. Similarly, we've been talking off and on about incentives. Okay? Um, what are the incentives, and how do we replicate those incentives? Sometimes it's monitoring and supervision. One of the things that we make big mistakes at in scaling is, yeah, I have one supervisor for every three community agricultural extension workers. Is that really scalable? And what happens if you don't have that kind of supervision? Okay. Well, we have pay for performance. Okay. If you, you know, you could pay by the number of farmers you deal with. Well, most government systems in developing countries, if it's a public sector worker, don't use pay for performance, and that would be a huge change. So how can we document these invisibles or tacit elements of how things work, especially on the incentive side? Or why are farmers adopting it? What was clear, credible, observable, and relevant to their needs? So um, and last but not least, as I've alluded to, sometimes we need to adapt these things. So we don't want to document the activities, actually. We want to be clear on what the principles or the outputs were, because we want the activity that will achieve that goal in a different context may be different. And so we want to be very clear on what these are. And last but not least, and I know it's a long list, is that we often need to simplify the model. Complex models are really hard to scale. The more the moving pieces, the more difficult. And often the more stakeholders that are involved, which multiply the stakeholder coordination, incentive alignment stuff geometrically. So if Somebody says, this is great. You did this 10-component model at $5,000 a farm or a small scale, but we only have the capacity and the finances to do a five-component, $2,000 a farmer. Which ones do you choose? Very few of our evaluations provide disaggregated impact evidence and cost evidence to allow us to make informed decisions. I know that costs extra money, but that's another reason for starting at small scale. So we can actually say, yes, these are the deluxe model, the catalog model, the gold-plated model is the 10 elements, but the core are these 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, for which we can get 80% of the impact for 50% of the price, or some, hopefully, or something like that. Um, I'm now back on, my, uh, on track here. Uh, on the value chain question, and how do we make sure, in fact, we get the smallholder farmers involved. In our work with EFAT, we found that EFAT actually has a real problem here. It is aiming to support mat mature and scaled up value chains in its countries. But at the same time, as it does so, one finds that actually uh, the, the smallholders, particularly the sm poorest smallholders and women smallholders, and, uh, are not actually effectively integrated. Or even worse, as uh, value chains mature, are actually almost systematically excluded. And so the challenge for EFAT is and I suspect very for you and your work, is to how do you get, especially subsistence, the, the large numbers in some countries still of subsistence farmers, to the point where they actually can be farmers that are attractive, if you wish, to the value chain operators in terms of the reliability of, uh, of uh, supplies, in terms of the, the quality of what they uh, support. Uh, and, and provide, and so on. And this is going to be, I think, the crucial area for engagement of, of organizations like you, like yourselves, is to make sure this particular transition from subsistence uh, smallholder farmer to actually commercial uh, farmers who can participate in the value chain that, that happens. The longer term issue that you refer to, I think, that particular is, I, from where I sit at least, is likely to be the issue for middle income countries. I've worked quite a lot in Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan still has 40% of the population in, in rural areas. 20% uh, I think of the, 
think of the populations actually in, in, in agricultural activities. Well, Kazakhstan is an upper middle income country. It's 20 years from now when it wants to be among sort of the top 30 actually developed countries, that structure is no longer going to be uh, valid. So the question for Kazakhstan and most middle income countries today that still have a sizable population in smallholder agriculture is how to effectively transfer, not how to keep them there, but how to, through successive, if you wish, uh, uh, upgrading of, of the human capacity of these people to actually help them make the transition to non-agricultural and ultimately non-rural and urban, urban occupations. And I think that is something where uh, a pathway approach and a longer term thinking approach uh, will be absolutely essential because unless you have that in mind, if you just sort of focus on keeping people on the farms, you're not likely to have the right uh, sort of model of change for that particular country. And so I think your question is absolutely right. And it has that sort of more short term, uh, how do you get people out of uh, subsistence into commercial farming for the lower income countries? And for the middle income countries, how do you manage that long term transition from rural to urban, from agriculture, sort of more traditional agriculture to modern capital intensive agriculture? Yeah, if I could just add a word on that. Um, having done a lot of work in Southeast Asia, we increasingly see the feminization of agriculture. That with the successful urbanization of countries like obviously China, Vietnam, and others, um, you have lots of prime age males who now work in urban industrial sectors leaving. And if you go to these areas, you basically only see women with children or of childbearing age and people under 18 and over 60 or 55, whatever, in the country. Often, uh, and one of the things I'm really pleased with in the Feed the Future program is, is gender is not simply a box that's checked, but it's taken quite seriously, is that women can often have challenges or issues in terms of access to finance, ability to buy land or own land or transfer land, especially in countries like Vietnam and China and to some extent Cambodia, which have coming out of a well, not coming out of, still to some extent in the communist or recently communist system, uh, land markets and other asset markets are not really well developed. So the type of transition that you were talking about often requires uh, the development of missing markets that don't exist. And um, particularly referring to the EFI work, the EFI particularly specializes in targets in marginalized indigenous peoples. And as, as uh, Johannes was alluding to, often those people um, the rising tide doesn't lift their boats. They are too far away. They don't speak the language. They're too poorly educated. The, the transportation and communication links are too poor that um, they're, they can't get locked into the get, address the market. And um, particularly in Vietnam, that's been a huge challenge. I mean, Vietnam has had an amazing success in commercializing agriculture and getting large percentages of the agricultural population involved in the market. But that's not been true for ethnic, particularly ethnic groups. And, Similarly, when I just went to China, as I alluded to, every single province that IFAD has a partnership with the government in is one of the, what they call autonomous provinces, which is a majority ethnic population. Um, and those people often live in very mountainous or jungle areas where the market doesn't penetrate very well. It's majority feminine, you know, female farmers. Uh, access to finance markets, uh, transportation is weak or doesn't exist. And so, um, I. I mean, sure, we know from the global reach of economic history of the inexorable shift out of agriculture, but it's not always clear that that's completely inexorable for uh, all of the population, and particularly the bottom that we want to address. So I think we need to. But I think your point's well taken. Thanks. Well, thanks, everybody, for those good questions. Um, unless there are other great ones right now, why don't we turn back to you, Richard, and let you go through some of your case examples. and. On, on this structural transformation question, I just wanted to add something about what Richard said is we're not trained into a specific technology. You know, we're actually, through the scaling process, building human capacity, you know, increasingly a, a business capacity, capacity to, um, to identify opportunities and sort of figure out, you know, how best to, uh, to, to utilize them. I, I think that's increasingly a, a cross-sectoral skill, right? So once you train communities, once you train farmers into how to recognize an opportunity, you're also sort of training them, you know, to recognize, well, what are the ladders you may want to use to get out of the sector one of these days? So um, I think that's, it is in essence about human capacity and about uh, skills development at, at core, I think, scaling. 
So Richard, let's let's turn back to you to. Thanks. Okay. Um, actually, uh, Julie, because uh, I only thought I had a half hour, I dropped the examples from my slides. I could speak to them spontaneously, but let me. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to talk about some of the sort of lessons. Uh, some of this will be uh, sort of repeating things, but I guess I was always taught: tell them what you're going to say, say it, and tell them what you said. So first of all, um, I think the, a key issue is identifying pathways and identifying pathways as early as possible. Um, this is the Apollo 13 problem. How are we going to get to large, if this works, if we can prove the concept, if the pilot project works, the innovation is successful, how are we going to get to scale? Are we going to deliver this to the private sector? Sector? Are we going to deliver it through the public sector? Are we going to try some mixed uh, public-private partnership uh, or through farmers' organizations, et cetera, et cetera? And what does that look like? Okay. In terms of how do we create that space, right? If we want to go through the private sector, we need to make sure that we're collecting the data that allows us to make the, the business case. When was the last time, well, maybe I'm just ignorant because I obviously don't have universal knowledge, but most of the projects I've worked with aren't collecting data to say, how profitable is it to do this activity? That's not what USAID projects do, usually. They deliver, right? They produce outcomes and output. You know, they deliver certain, you know, we've increased farmer yield. But was it profitable to deliver those seeds? Would it be profitable to somebody else to do that? What does it take to do that? Or same question. Is this aligned with the policy priorities that the Ministry of Agriculture system is going to do with it? Is it within their capabilities? Do they have the Agricultural Extension Service? Do they have the training? Do they have the research stations? Do they have the innovation capabilities that are necessary to do this? So let's think about, to begin with, this is why it's iterative, right? We're having something that works. We want to deliver to this population, but this population is served by these actors, these pathways, these organizations. How can we iterate between what works and what can be delivered and strengthening the system? So in a sense, that was the circle that I didn't get a chance to go over, is we have here an innovation, right? It achieves certain results, and it has certain implementation requirements, right? We want to deliver it at this scale, with this impact. Okay, so is the sp does the space exist to deliver this at that scale? Are there organizations that can do it? Is the financing available, whether that's private sector incentives, the affordability of the farmers or public? Are the politics aligned and the rest of the ecosystem, or in this case, the value chain? And um, what's the pathway that is the best to get this scale, this impact of this model? My experience is that when we do this, we tend to do these um, in isolation. We have a model, we know its scale, and we know who we want to work with. But we never ask whether the model's aligned, or the system is aligned. What do I mean by that? Do these pathways have the capability to deliver this innovation? Do they have the capacity to deliver at this scale? The answer to that is usually no, actually, regardless of what we'd like to think. And in that case, how do we align this now that we have some choices? If we simplify the model, so it's aligned with the existing capabilities or what we could do reasonably in terms of capacity building, yeah, okay, that gets us aligned here, but then often our impact, we have to be more modest in our impact goals, okay? Or conversely, we say we want to do the, the full Monty, the whole program in its complexity and its high impact, but only a limited set of actors could deliver that, in which case we have to be more circumspect in what scale we can deliver it. Okay. So until we have these spaces and, and things aligned in terms of this model with the requirements to implement it, at that scale with the organizations and pathways, we don't have a, a coherent scaling up strategy we haven't met. And I guess my opinion is what, one of the, break, the principal breakdown in scaling up is not so much that we don't have good innovation, and sometimes it's not even that we have ambitions at scale, is that we really haven't aligned them. So that we have realistic goals and pathways that can and, and models that can achieve get get us where we want to go. Okay. And since I know particularly some of the people online are are in the process of doing this, uh, that's really key. Okay. Um, I've emphasized but I want to re emphasize the importance of having an intermediate organization and leadership to manage and coordinate the scaling up process, which is creating those spaces if it doesn't exist and driving the process. OK, 
Okay. This means who's going to do the demonstration marketing? Who's going to bring the private sector actors on board at scale? All this. One of the things, you know, we were talking, um, so put on my economist hat, often parts of the value chain are lumpy, right? So at small scale, we persuaded this supermarket chain to buy the farmer's product. Well, we want to go to four other places. Does that supermarket chain work in those four other places, or do we need to engage four other people, right? Or if we're going to double the size, the existing buyer can't handle that volume, okay? So we actually have to put in places parts of the system uh, elsewhere. Often, we need to improve cost efficiency. With all due respect, what USAID can afford or what makes sense for you guys may not necessarily fit within domestic budget constraints, okay? And again, this is part of starting, this is the Apollo 13 model, or starting with the end in mind, right? What is the domestic budget constraint? Is it $500 a person? Or if a farmer is going to pay for it, it's $20 for seeds. If seeds cost more than that, it's not going to work. Okay? So this is where we need to align the market incentives and financing. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder partnership. Who is going to coordinate those partners? Why, why are they going to be a partnership? Okay, what's in it for them? Building organizational capacity, strengthening the ecosystem and the value chain, and as I said, monitoring both for fidelity on the one hand and adapting to local conditions. So if whether it's we're going to scale up through um, one of our implementing partners or through some other mechanism, whoever does this, whoever fulfills that intermediary role, and it could be more than one organization, needs to have, do all these things and have the skills and resources to do them. Okay, and this is a partial list. Okay. So I guess I just want to repeat the conclusion is that there are multiple pathways to scale up. There is no one right way. Okay. Horizontal versus vertical, through the farmers, through the private sector. What does it depend on? It depends on the characteristics of the intervention itself. What does that require to implement, right? And then we have to compare the characteristics of the intervention of the model with existing capabilities to see where there's the best match, right? In some cases, the best match will be with the public sector or the private sector or farmers, the farmers organizations, and sometimes it'll be a mix. This component works really, is a really good fit here. Okay, so um, getting, and then it's a question of a scale. Well, these organizations have the right capabilities to implement this program, but can they uh, implement at that scale? Okay, so iterating between the requirements of the program, the organizational capacities, and the target scale is, is, is how you come up with a, a successful pathway and scaling up strategy. Okay. And as I said before, the principal challenges are aligning the incentives and the politics. And this is both vertical and horizontal, multiple organizations and from federal or national level all the way down. Making sure there's effective organizational implementation capacity and that the unit production and delivery costs versus the financial constraints fit. So I, I think that's pretty much what I've got to say. Well, actually, that's not true. I lead three-day scaling up training workshops, but that's what I've got to say in an hour and a half. Why don't we give a hand to Johannes and Richard, please? Okay, I think, you know, what I take away from these conclusions is some excitement, uh, Richard and Johannes, because I think we're starting to see in a number of our Feed the Future programs, we're, we're seeing the, uh, the germs of, of takeoff, right, and some, some promising, I think, accidental, perhaps, intermediary organizations on the ground you know, who are starting to do many of the things that, that you've characterized for us here. So our question now is, is how to fan the flames, um, fan the incentives, I guess, in those countries, and also, sorry for the mixed metaphor. I'm noticing a pattern, feed the future, fan the flames. Yeah. F All right, F don't go too far with that. Okay. <laughs> so, and also, how do we extend, you know, what, what's good things that are happening in our feed the future programs and the value chain approach, I think, and focus uh, that Feed the Future has brought to these programs, how do we extend those lessons to other Feed the Future countries so we can have that, that uh, flame fanning and intermediary organization take off in a number, uh, wider number of places. Um, I'd also like to introduce Gary Yan. Gary is here. Uh, Gary um, has taken over from Andy Levin uh, the, the, the job, the, the wonderful job of scaling team leader. Um, and we have others with us, uh, Laura Schrieg there, okay, Judy Payne, who 
Who else is with us from our scaling team? OK, John Colton, right, OK. So and several others who are not, not with us today. So um, thanks again. And uh, st uh, please stay tuned. We have a special scaling page on our AgriLinks, uh, Feed the Future AgriLinks website, where we put all of the resources from our two recent scaling glees. Um, we'll also have this webinar um, and many other delightful resources that, uh, that Gary and Julie and team are shepherding forward. Thank you. Okay.